Bye, friends. Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's Day. Sunday morning at 9 o'clock Pacific Time. The Deep Things of God with Brother Mike. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, how to interpret the Bible and some of the things you've got to do to be very careful while you're uh, interpreting God's Word. You know, it's kind of, it's risky. It's risky. And uh, that's why we have so many false doctrines all over the place and people misinterpreting the word and not understanding it. They don't learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. And you have to learn that if you're going to have a strong ministry, if you're going to have an anointed ministry, if you want to have a ministry of the moving of the spirit. Uh, years ago, I used to be a secular counselor for 25 years. And uh, my youngest daughter, Tracy, led me to the Lord. And I slowly, over a period of years, transitioned out of secular counseling into Christian counseling. And then I went from there to my local radio program, which I've been on for 20 years now. Uh, February, I'll be on 21 years. And uh, I transitioned out of secular counseling to Christian counseling, then went into deliverances. And God taught me everything, every step of the way. And I had to have a series of divine revelations or I wasn't going to be able to do it because I had worked 25 years as a counselor and uh, I had never actually cured anybody. I um, was successful. I had a counseling center in downtown Phoenix that away and uh, made lots of money. Okay. I had a, I was making 150 grand. That was back in the early 90s. That's pretty good money back then. Now it's, you know, 150 grand in a month or much. But I learned uh, for all the years that I was in church that the Word of God is divinely inspired. And uh, the Bible is completely different from any other book anywhere on the planet because it was God breathed. <sighs> Numa Suesta. It breathed out of the Holy Ghost. Father breathed out the word. And it says the uh, prophets and apostles, they were carried along by the Holy Ghost. And the word of God is God breathed. So if you read one of my books or you read um, any Christian book at the Christian bookstore or at your church, they have a bookstore. As soon as you leave the Bible section, you left the God breathe section and you went over to writings that had, you know, anointed material in it. Um, my book on Satan healing and healing of mental illness, those three books, they are not God-breathed, but they have anointed material in them. My book on the root cause and cure of mental illness were divine revelations that God gave me over the years so that I could understand true psychology and psychiatry because I did not have that knowledge as a secular counselor. You don't get divine revelations going to a secular university, which is what I did. I went to Emporia State University in Kansas. It's a good school. I got my bachelor's degree. I got my master's degree, you know, a bunch of certifications after that. But that that cannot substitute for the God-breathed Word of God. That's totally different than anything else in the Christian bookstore. If you read a Christian book, there's a lot of good material in it, probably. There's uh, a lot of anointed material in it, but it is not God-breathed. When you leave the Bible section of your book, Christian bookstore, you left the God-breathed section. Okay? So that's the most important section of your uh, Bible bookstore. That's the most important section. And I use the King James Bible. There are several, but obviously there's several other Bibles that are really good out there. 
In terms of the best translation of the New Testament, you know, I would probably go with the New King James or Young's literal translation or something like that. A Bible that uses uh, the Textus Recepticus, which is the stack of um, ancient Greek copies that was um, used by the King James writer translators, New King James, Young's Bibles like that. So if you read those kind of Bibles, you won't have a bunch of verses missing out of your Bible because some of the newer translations use the Westcar Holt collection of ancient Greek manuscripts and they don't have the verses on them that the received text does. So I always recommend that you use a Bible, or read a Bible that uses the received text as its foundation, because then you're not going to be missing any verses. Uh, Mark chapter 16, half that ver half that chapter isn't even in several Bibles. And of course, Mark 16, the last half of the chapter was part of the great commission of Christ. And they left it out. It's not, it's not in the West Cart Holt uh, collection of ancient Greek manuscripts. You got to be careful with that. But here today, I wanted to share with you some of the things you really need to be careful of because English words don't translate many Greek words very clearly. They're not clear transitions. Okay, and I want to share a few of them with you today, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Uh, I bought a brand new tablet for you today. This is a really nice one. Um, for example, you've heard of the word judge, of course. Well, the word judge is an English word, word J-U-D-G-E. That's a problem, isn't it? Yes, it is. Because... That same English word is used to translate these Greek words as an example, and they don't have the same meanings, but they're translated here as judge. So when you read the text, the English translation may be not expressing it the way it's meant to be expressed. For example, Croesus is a Greek noun, and it is a translated as judge in the Bible, but it actually means to evaluate or discriminate or discern something. Okay? And the Bible teaches that you and I are to judge each other. Well, wait a minute. No, we're, we're, it says do not judge. No. The Bible says we're supposed to evaluate one another, but not judge one another, which is the Greek verb krino, which means to evaluate and come to a conclusion. Okay? Oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. He does this. He said that. He's a this. Okay, that is a sin. You just judged someone, your brother. You just judged another Christian. So you evaluated him and you came to a conclusion, crino. Unfortunately, that word crino is also translated in many translations, King James included, as judge. So now you're not understanding the difference between, the subtle differences between crisis and crino. The noun for crino is crema. This Greek word, katakrino, means to do all three. You evaluate the person and make an assessment of what they said or did. Then you come to a conclusion about that person, and then you sentence the person. Pontius Pilate, katakrino, Jesus, he evaluated him. He came to a conclusion he was innocent. Then, because he was operating in fear, he condemned him to death. 
all three. So the Bible says that you and I are to crisis one another, judge each other, but we are not to judge each other. And so this doesn't make any sense if you don't understand that there's a subtle difference between these, this terminology. Let's take another brief example for a second. The word world is found in the Bible in numerous places, but we don't know what the Bible is really talking about when it says the world. Most of the time you figure it out in the context. But for example, gay is the Greek word for world, but it means earth, the earth, the planet earth, world. Uh, cosmos is the Greek word for world, but it means the human world or humanity. This word ion is the Greek word for world, but it actually means age. So if you see the word world in the text, you've got to make sure, is it the planet Earth, is it humanity, or is it the ages, right? We're in the age of grace or the dispensation of grace right now, right? There's a future dispensation coming. There are eternal ages coming. In eternity past, there were ages I owned. But that would also be translated world. And if you don't see the subtle difference, you'll misinterpret the verse. You got to be careful with it. Like oikumene is another Greek word translated as world, but it actually means area or land occupied by humans. So oikumene uh, would not represent Antarctica, for example. Generally speaking, speaking, there's no humans living there. It would be an area or middle of the jungle in Ecuador. Hey, there's nobody living there. So that Greek word, translated world, has a different meaning than the other ones. For example, Jesus, in John chapter 3, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What world are we talking about here? Well, that's correct. You're right. Cosmos, human world. Jesus didn't die on the cross of Calvary for the earth. The earth isn't going anywhere. anywhere. The Bible says the earth is eternal. It never disappears. It lasts through eternity. Correct? The world is an English word used to describe other Greek words. And you have to be careful when you're interpreting the text to make sure, you know, you're not off on a tangent. And there's an effort, for example, let's take uh, men and women here. Uh, <clears throat> a man and a woman is the English word, right? But it's actually... Anthropos, okay, which means humanity. That could mean males or females, okay? Now, contrary to popular belief, there's only two sexes. There's males and there's females. There's boys, there's girls, okay? The reason the devil is introducing us to the trans market is because he's, once again, everything he does revolves around cutting down God-breathed scripture. His main goal in his life is to get human beings to delete the Bible. And so the trans marketing project is Satan saying, no, Genesis is wrong. There are 72 genders. There's 50 genders. There are however many there are. His everything always goes back to the devil stopping this God-breathed material because he knows that if you believe it, he can't stop it. The Bible is his greatest fear and his worst enemy. He's afraid of it, scared. 
because a child who believes the word of God, God breathed word of God, can destroy the strongholds of the devil. He fears it more than anything, period. But if you see the word man, it may also be the Greek word an heir here, which means usually means a husband. Agune there means usually means a wife. So, for example, uh, an anthropos Greek word was not used with the woman at the well. It, this word was used. She was a gune, a wife. Even though at that time she was not technically married, Jesus was looking out through the eyes of God, and she had been married five times. And at the time Jesus met her, she was living with another guy. And Jesus went right past that sin and looked right into her heart and saw her need. Uh, that's divine greatness, you know, putting it mildly. Just another thought here. For example, just to give you another idea, a child or children. Now, that's the English translation, obviously. There it is. But that is a problem because in this New Testament, these Greek words sometimes are translated as child, but they're not. So if you see the English word child, it could be a technon. A technon is a preteen, you know, uh, junior high school, for example. Uh, Idea, it would be something similar to a grade schooler. A napius would be similar to a toddler, a babbling little child. And breathless here is the Greek word for an infant, a baby. Okay. That Greek word, breathless, is used um, for babies in the womb. That's why um, when a child is aborted, they go to heaven because they are a breathless, a baby, a human being. And that's the scriptural foundation for uh, people that are that are pro-life. <clears throat> Let me give you an example here real quickly. If you go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, you will see a universal spiritual law that is essentially the same as a universal natural law. And, and they always use gravity as the example. Gravity is a natural law that you and I can't get away from. Unless you're in space, obviously that's zero gravity. But for most of us, the only space we're going to be in is the space be between our ears. It empties out sometimes. But in Galatians 6, verse 7, it says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, spiro is a Greek word. It means to dispense seeds in a field. They had a sacks in their satchels on their shoulders and they threw the seed through the field, stero. It says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Threedzo means to harvest. You harvest it. So if I jump off a building, grab the natural law from God, gravity, pulls me down to the center of the earth. I don't make it there. I hit the surface of the earth, and I'm dead. Spiritually, it works exactly the same way. Whatever a Christian or a sinner sows, the seed they 
throw out. That is the harvest they will reap, good or bad. So the Bible wants you to renew your mind, repent of your sins, and become intimately familiar with the God-breathed text because he wants you to sow, sow righteousness, healing, deliverance, miracles, blessings. He wants you to sow all the things that Christ died to give you. That makes Father happy. He likes that. And he likes you. But if you sow to the flesh, Paul said, you will harvest fleshly crap. Okay? Bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, bad feelings about other people. The Bible calls that ought. You know, attitude problems, rage, hate, anger, self-hatred. Uh, yesterday, I, every the fourth Saturday of every month, I have a deliverance training class. And at the end of the service, there was a woman there who had been coming to the services, uh, I don't know, for a few months. And uh, she was still struggling. And then as I was talking to her, God revealed to her that she had regrets in life. Regrets is a form of self-ought, self-rejection. Oh, I should have done this. I should have did that. Oh, I'm so bad. I'm so stupid. What was I thinking? I'm a moron. I'm an idiot. I'm a vegetable. All those negative thoughts, spir spiral, sow seeds of harvest, depression, sadness, hopelessness. And when she realized that she was holding self-ought, self-rejection, the Holy Spirit jumped on her and the demons came flying out left and right. And she was healed. But she had been sowing regret, and she was harvesting sadness, sorrow, misery. Those spiritual laws and those natural laws work whether you believe them or not, whether you know about them or not, or whether you care or not. It doesn't matter. The laws of God work, period, it doesn't matter what a human being thinks or does. Those are the laws. That's it. Now, let's take a quick look briefly of kind of some of the things I was talking about earlier. Matthew chapter 7. This is an enormous chapter on commandments for Christians to be successful spiritually in this life so they can be heavily rewarded in the next life. Matthew 7, Jesus said, quote, judge not that you be not judged. Now, that's the Greek verb we went over a minute ago, krino. That's the Greek verb, krino. It means to evaluate someone and then come to a conclusion about them. It's not the Greek noun, krisis, which means to make an assessment or an evaluation and or to discern what they're saying or doing. That's not the word. Crino means to evaluate them, check them out, assess them, and then come to a conclusion. Oh, they said this and that and that and this. Oh, they're, that's the kind of person they are. They are a blank. Well, Jesus said the laws of God of sowing and reaping are telling you that if you do that to someone, other people are going to do it to you. If you judge someone, crino, evaluate and conclude on that person, then somebody else somewhere at the church, at work, what have you, they are going to do it to you. And does that have anything to do with you praying or not liking it or wanting it or being ignorant or stupid? Nothing. It's part of the laws of God. It's like gravity. Gravity doesn't care what you think. If you violate that law, you pay the price, period. 
Jesus said, for with what judgment, crema, the noun for crino, once again, to evaluate and come to a conclusion, the judgment that you judged on that person, you shall be crino judged. Why? Because whatever measure you meet out will be measured back to you again. Different wording, same law. Whatever man sows, spiro, that's what he's going to harvest. Jesus explains that verse in greater detail in Luke chapter 6. Really interesting. Check this out. Judge not and you will not be judged. Same phrase, same Greek word, krino. Judge not. Don't evaluate somebody and then come to a conclusion on them. Don't do that because other people will do it to you. Then he says, kara diskazo. He says, condemn not, and you will not be condemned. That's a Greek verb that means to judge and put in a negative place. You got this person all figured out? They are now a that. You put them in that category. You've been, they've been condemned to false prophet, liar, idiot, moron, goof. And you put them in a category. Pervert, queer, idiot category. Condemn not. And you will not be put in categories by others. Law of sowing and reaping. Then he says, forgive and you should be forgiven. That's the Greek word, apluo, and it means to release. Okay? Somebody screws you over, and you must release it from yourself. Apluo, you release the wound, you release the hurt, you release the ought, the bitterness, the anger, the frustration, Forgive, release, and you shall be released. God will release you of your sin if you will release others for theirs. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You release and let it go. God releases you and lets you go. How about another example? Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 41. It says, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, this was after Mary uh, got the word that she was going to be pregnant with Jesus from Gabriel. She goes to visit Elizabeth, remember? And it says here, when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, John the Baptist was in the womb at the time, but he was called a breathless or a baby. And he was alive. He leaped in, the, in her womb, triggering the anointing, and then Elizabeth prophesied. Remember that story? But that's the Greek word breathless, so we know that was a baby. So a baby in the womb or a baby in your arms is still a breathless. That's why uh, people are Christians are pro-life. Matthew chapter 5, check this out. You are the salt of the earth. Greek word gay. Okay, and so now we're, he's saying you're the salt of the planet that you live on, he says. But if the salt goes bad on you, how are you going to salt the planet Earth where you live? It's not good for anything. You just get rid of it. Then he says, you are the light of the world. Now he goes to a different word that we mentioned earlier, cosmos, the human world, humanity. You are the light of humanity. Not gay, the planet Earth. You are the light of the human world. 
John 3.16. God so loved the world, the cosmos, human world, that he gave his son. You're like a city sitting on a hill that can't be hid. That city on the hill is always exposed. Nobody can put a fence around it. If they did, you could still see it. Once it's on a hill, it's there permanently. You can see it. Nothing can be done about it. It's a natural loss. You can visually see an object on a hill and you can't block it. Well, that's what you are. You are the light of humanity. Right? That's what Jesus called himself. I am the light of the cosmos, the human world. The human world. It doesn't mean the universe. It doesn't mean our solar system, the Milky Way. He's talking about humans world here on gay the earth and he says listen since you've got a light lit in your room you don't put a bushel over it to block the light that's unnatural and that goes against god's laws light is the law of god that lights up a room he says you're like lighting up a room but it's the human world you light up. You are the light of humanity. Another check on John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Now that's interesting, isn't it? It says, quote, as the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, he was in the deserts until the day that he manifest to Israel. Now, that Greek word, again, is what, the one we mentioned earlier, paideia. It says, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirits. Now, John the Baptist is no longer a brephus. He is a paideian, a junior high school, something like that, child. And so this, so this verse in 180 fast forwards to when John the Baptist was several years old, eight, nine, ten, something like that. And so if you don't understand that the word child can have different Greek roots, you may misinterpret the scripture. I just interpreted it exactly as it was written for you because I was looking at the text, the Greek text, and I was looking at the exact words that uh that it's written and they have different meanings they have they have different meanings let me give you another example just a short one john chapter 5 jesus said i can on my own self do nothing as i hear i judge crino i evaluate and i come to the conclusion about a person. It didn't say catacrino, I sentence you. It doesn't say that. And Jesus didn't come to sentence us. He came to save us. And Jesus said, I judge and my judgment is just. Now there's the Greek word, krisis. Greek noun, it means to evaluate or assess something. Jesus said his assessments or evaluations of humanity are just. Dikaios is the Greek word, which is an adjective. It means equitable, fair, impartial. So what Jesus is saying here is that I am evaluating you and I am coming to a conclusion about you, but I am not sentencing you. And the conclusion I come to and my evaluation process is just. It's fair and balanced. It's impartial. And he says, because I do not seek my own will, I seek the will of the Father. Jesus once said, I only speak the things I hear Father saying. I only do the things I see Father doing. By extension, he went on to explain that you are an extension of Christ and you are to do the things you saw your Savior doing. 
and you are to say the things you heard your Savior say. Jesus once said, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. John chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to appearance. The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Judge not. Krino, Greek verb, evaluate and come to a conclusion. Don't do that based on the appearance of the person. What's going to happen to you if you do? People will judge you, Crino, based on your appearance. Why? Because the law of God said, whatever you sow, that's what you're also going to reap. Okay? If you're sleeping with somebody else and you're cheating on your spouse down the road, that's going to boomerang on you, and then your spouse is going to do the same thing. If you're in bed with somebody else down the road, you're going to reap what you sowed. And your spouse will either get divorced and sleep with somebody or have an affair. and see It all comes back, everything boomerangs on everyone. You put in the time and the study for the word and your devotionals and your prayer, the anointing will come upon you and the power of God will overshadow you and you will be the light of the world and you will be sitting on a hill and you will not be hid. You'll have so many referrals, you would not believe it. So many referrals. I came out of the Assemblies of God religion and I worked so hard for the Lord all those years and saw very little fruit. And it was something. I, I Sometimes I got so discouraged, I almost backslid two or three times. This was before I realized that I had evil spirits. I had demons. I picked them up during my sinful um, sin, life as a sinner. I was a pretty good sinner, not a superstar sinner like the people that come to see me. But I was, I was doing poorly, and I did bad. And I picked up demons. I just... Through the law of sowing and reaping, I was reaping adultery. I picked up lust demons. You know, I was reaping strife. I picked up anger demons. And they, they tormented me all the way through my Christian life. This went on for years in the Assemblies of God. I did everything I could to get rid of it. Finally, God, supernaturally, at the appointed time, I found a book in a Christian bookstore by a preacher in Prescott, Arizona. It was a deliverance book, and it was a small paperback. It was just perfect. I read that and could not believe it. It was it was absolutely a miracle. I was re almost reading my biography. And that's what led me to go through deliverance, transition out of secular counseling, into the ministry. And it's been, the blessings have been enormous. I have literally seen thousands of people get delivered from demons and hundreds of people physically healed right in front of my eyes. Of course, the Holy Ghost did all that, but he had to prepare me going through long trials and pain and tribulation and learning the law of sowing and reaping before I realized that I could have the anointing and the desire and compassion for others to help. And that's how it works. It works that way for all of us. But I learned over the years not to judge people by their appearance because appearances are deceptive, right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but beauty is uh, underpinned by character, integrity. And beautiful people many times don't have character or integrity. People with gorgeous bodies, GQ physiques, knockout bodies, can be some of the most ugh, sickening people you've ever met. Just terrible. You never judge a relationship by appearances only. Oh, my gosh, I can't wait to marry him. He's, he's so good looking. He's packing. He looks great. Oh, look at the clothes. Oh, he smells so good. That is a delusion from Satan 
trying to get you to marry somebody he knows will bring hell to breakfast in your house. It's all a trick. I would say 90 to 95% of marriages, I do marriage counseling a lot. I'd say 90 to 95% of them are all demonic. The couple got married for demonic reasons, wrong reasons. They didn't increase this, it didn't take the evaluation they needed. Stuff about the person got past them. Character, integrity, faithfulness, work ethic. They didn't see it because they were judging by an appearance, crino. They evaluated and came to a conclusion about a person. And Jesus said, don't do that. John 8, chapter 15. Judge, you judge after the flesh. I don't judge any man like that. Crino, evaluate and conclude. You judge after the flesh. Sinners, scribes, Pharisees, and so on. I do not do that. But when I judge, Crino, evaluate and come to a conclusion, my judgment Increases my evaluation, my assessment, my discernment is true. Why is it true? He said, because I'm not alone. I judge based on the Father who sent me. So when Jesus at Crino, when Jesus judges and comes to a conclusion, he is doing it in conjunction with Father. He doesn't judge after the flesh. He never does that. And you should never do it either. If any man hears my words and doesn't believe it, Jesus said, I do not judge him. Crino, evaluate him and come to a conclusion. Oh, I, I gave you the message of the gospel. You didn't believe me? Oh, you're a sinner. You're done. No, he doesn't do that. You get another chance. He's open to another chance. He wants to give you another chance. Or he said, quote, I came not to judge the world, but to save. Greek word sozo means to deliver the world. Greek word kosmos. I came not to judge humanity, but to deliver humanity, is what he's saying in John chapter 12, verse 47. So you can learn to interpret the God-breathed text accurately and not make mistakes and go through assumptions, okay? Whenever you're reading the word, you never judge the word by appearances only. Oh, that seems to say that. Be careful with that. Every Friday night I teach at the Arizona Deliverance Center. I'm very careful to post the text on the PowerPoint screen and make sure I'm interpreting it correctly. And if it goes against the conventional wisdom, my attitude is that's your problem. You have to do the right thing. You have to be a city set on a hill that can't be hid. You don't care what others think of you, including your family, because they will not support you. And if you want to get into deliverance and healing, which I hope you do, and it is part of the Great Commission, um, Mark chapter 16, Matthew chapter 28, I hope you will preach repentance and forgiveness of sins through the name of Jesus. That's the third part of the Great Commission in Luke chapter 24. And there it is. You must do that, but you can't care what other people think of you. And you can't take offenses that other people criticize you. I get enormous criticism in my ministry. And God, the devil told me, man, you're, you're doing a great job. He said, uh, congratulations to you. I'd, I'd have a little self-pity if I was you. You're not being treated fairly. These people are turning on you. They don't like you. Uh, I told the devil, hey, uh, find somebody to screw you and get out of my den. 
I don't care what somebody thinks about me. I'm not taking offense against that person. If they don't like me, hey, it is what it is. I'm good. But you can't compromise the Bible because if you do, the, the devil eventually takes over your whole country. And that would be what? The United States is being taken over by Satan because people looked at the God-breathed text and they said, whoa, we can't teach that. Miracles aren't for today. Gifts died out with the apostles. Speaking in tongues is satanic. We got to, oh, we can't, we, we can't go with God's word. Repentance? What's that? Oh, no, no. It's peace, prosperity, abundant life. That's what it is. Let's get a seeker-friendly message. No, 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 no. You send that to the gates of hell. You just read the truth. And if Jesus said it, that's the end of it, period. And as I mentioned earlier, that's the devil's number one goal. Trash the Bible, and I can take the country. And he's right, it worked, and it's happening right in front of our eyes. When that insane cop in Minneapolis murdered that uh, criminal, the cop was white, the criminal was black. The autopsy revealed the guy, poor guy had so much fentanyl in him, it could have killed a horse. I mean, this, this guy was a very powerful person. His name was uh, Floyd something. I mean, he was superpowered guy. He wasn't dead. He should have been dead before the cops even got there based on the amount of fentanyl he had in the system. But the devil took that one incident and started his Sherman's March to the Sea, as in the Civil War. He took over half the United States through one incident. Let me explain something to you. If you will take the word of God, God breathed, and not compromise it, stand in the fire and take some heat, one incident, could trigger a revival in your life and in your church. One incident. Satan used it. He had one incident. A psycho cop kills a, kills a guy with people filming him. I mean, he looked right up in the camera. And there was four or five people standing there with their cell phones. Oh, look, look he's killing this guy. And he didn't stop. You know that was satanic. You know it was demonic. His demons told him, just keep going. Keep, keep your knee on his neck there. He's fine. It's all good. The guy dies, and it was being filmed. You can't tell me that wasn't satanic. I don't believe it. I'm, I'm positive it was. But the point is, one incident triggered Satan's revival in America, the destruction of the United States. Everybody, after that happened, was emboldened to rise to the top and start the war. Rioters, killers, the wokes, criminals, everything. Everything is running amok now. And it's all a part of the great delusion the Bible speaks of in Revelation. But it got that way because people didn't rightly divide the word of truth, which is what I try to do on Friday nights and what I try to do on this podcast every Sunday morning. At nine o'clock. Now, remember the website hardcorechristianity.com. You got to go to the teaching button there at the top, Oop. and then you've got to go down and read these articles. They're short, but they're loaded with truth, and uh, the Greek text is included to prove it. And if you want to go into the healing and deliverance ministry, that teaching button is enormously helpful. Send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I will send you the miracle list. If you are a mentally ill Christian, I have one for them. If you are a troubled Christian, I have one for them. That miracle list works 100% of the time for those who do it. You know, my heartache is that I ship that list out dozens of times a week. 
and only a small percentage of people actually do it. You'll run into that in your ministry. You will have people that come to you for help, but they don't really want it. They don't want any help. And they won't sacrifice for God, but they will make enormous sacrifices for sin. Enormous sacrifices. It is very hard work to be a drug addict. It's very difficult to be an alcoholic. You gotta work hard, you gotta dedicate yourself, you gotta push it to sin. Many sins are not easy. Pedophiles, that's a tough job. You gotta be patient, you gotta learn to be a stalker, you gotta manipulate people's minds. Hey, it, it takes work. Well, people live in sin all the time. They come to you, and then they say, oh, I want, I want help. I want God this. I want God that. But actually, they don't. They work hard for sin, but they won't work hard for the Lord. And if they don't do the miracle list, they never get delivered. The miracle list was compiled over years of research. And if you go down that list, it hits every bullet point for your miracle your healing and your deliverance. It's right there. Please remember that we have a Zoom service every Wednesday night. It's a deliverance service. And Brother Rick and the ministry team are on there at 6 p.m. Pacific time. If you send me an email, I'll send you the code and the password. And if you want to make a donation to ministry, just go to the website. There's a PayPal button on there. I don't like PayPal, but there's not another halfway decent option yet. As soon as I get another option, I'm going to get away from PayPal. But anyway, I have, that's what I'm stuck with now. And um, a lot of people send us donations. I do not take a salary in the ministry. So if you send the money in, it doesn't go to my limousines and my mansions and my yachts. Okay. I bought those years ago. Uh, that, you know, you don't need to pay for them. I already did. Okay. We don't spend any money on anything like that. Nothing. Okay, this is this is hardcore Christianity, not softcore. This isn't a seeker friendly system here, as you can tell by the way I talk. People need the truth. They gotta have it. Because you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. All right, I love you. I'll see you next time.